Too much. They simply proved too much. Too much talent. The gap was too wide. What do you want to hear? The Philadelphia Eagles opened up the season struggling against good teams, struggling against teams that were destined for a playoff run or simply to make the playoffs. And what happened? The competition shifted. We looked at all of these great things that we thought were doing the Eagles favors, that the Eagles themselves maybe on top of that were taking advantage of any opportunity just smack given and handed to them in their lap. Eagles had a very unique season this year, especially because they did some good things and they did some things that weren't good. And it's tough to balance. It's tough to look at the gray area. First and foremost, that was an absolute embarrassment. It was humiliating. It was difficult to watch the Philadelphia Eagles just simply give up or not be prepared to then give up to have very little. And a couple of players out there made some plays on defense, but ultimately the defensive coordinator remains lost. The offense just refused to take advantage of things that were in their favor, that, that they had the ability from a matchup standpoint to exploit, and for whatever reason they refused to. Jalen Hurts was awful in the biggest moment. Devontae Smith was forgotten, just absolutely neglected. You can't. You can't come out in the playoffs like this. And this is why you had to start guys against the Cowboys. This is why you had to address certain things that were plaguing this team against bad squads. You can't come out slow against Tom Brady. You can't on defense just allow Brady to dink and dunk when you know that he's down a couple of big play guys on the outside. You just can't. And they did. They allowed the Bucs to do whatever they wanted, and it's really disappointing to end the season that way. And before we look at what happened this year, and I'll tell you two things that you need to pay attention to moving forward. G. Cobb is going to join us to look back at the year. We're going to have Jimmy Kemsky, Evan Macy, and Matt Mullen all at once on a nice panel to look back as well. But Despite what you're about to hear from Nick Sirianni, the moment was simply too big. We know that you can't make mistakes like that in the in the playoffs uh, against a really good football team, and and we did. I don't want to say the moment got got too big for him. I just think we made some, we made some mistakes. Coaching it always starts with me as a coach. Um, there were some coaching mistakes, and you know there's going to be much. guys that are going to want some plays back out there. But I, I didn't feel and I didn't sense for a moment that it, the moment was too big for him. It was a great atmosphere here. Uh, but that that never that I never felt that out there. We just we just didn't make make some plays. and We didn't coach good enough at the end of the day. Look, it was too big. The spotlight, the pressure, having to do things that you're not accustomed to doing. That's what gets me the most is that the Eagles in that stretch of beating up on bad teams, which they deserve all the credit for in the world. They never really cleaned up the issues against good teams. And unfortunately, it does tarnish a lot of what they did at the final stretch because while it's a great stepping stone, and look, we're balancing. We're balancing things here. While it's a great stepping stone to look at this season and say, wow, look how hot they were at the end of the year and they took advantage of teams that were worse than them outside of that one Giants game, they still were able to go out there and beat bad teams. The problem, though, is that they never learned anything from it. They got lazy. They got complacent. They got stuck going through motions. And you know what they did? They became okay with just either taking too many risks at the start of games or not being present enough mentally, physically to just not having enough. They got way too comfortable with being bad at the start and knowing that they had talent to pull themselves out of it. That's on coaching. That's on coaching all around. Players need to improve. Players need to get better and grow on the field. So do coaches. And we didn't see any of that. Jonathan Gannon reverted right back to what we saw at the start of the year, which is just hoping and praying that guys in front of him on the field can bail him out, which we started to see once a lineman or two went down for the Bucs, and it was just the four guys up front getting some pressure. It wasn't like Gannon did anything. Please, at Shando Show, leave me a comment below here, of course, after you hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the Philly Voice channel. But tell me, what am I missing? Where was this major adjustment? Where was this scheme? What happened here that I missed with Jonathan Gannon? 
Gannon doing anything. That was constant all year. At least with the offense and Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts, you can look back and say they adjusted. They were able to learn from mistakes in the first six, seven games and then flip that and at least stay to an identity. All Gannon did was just get lucky. Look, I have a major problem with this defense moving forward because you're now relying on Howie Roseman in the draft to identify guys who don't need much coaching. And if they do, who's going to do it? A guy who's not even making any adjustments? You luck out with Darius Slay, how how much he helps, not only the coaching, but also the guys around him back there. A ball hawk, all pro caliber player. You've got Fletcher Cox, Hargraves up front. You've got Barnett, I know at times, but still, you've got guys that are more than capable up front of beating an offensive lineman. And linebackers have benefited from both, from guys in front and behind them. There's no drastic change in scheme or approach or anything like that. Schwartz had a plan. Schwartz was able to adjust. Anybody was able to adjust. Billy Davis was able to adjust. What the hell do we have here? It's frustrating. That's frustrating. The way, the nature in which they lose that game. Inexcusable how that goes down like that. And you have every right to be upset that there was nothing, no change, no pressure, no approach that should have differed on Tom Brady. Instead, it was just, well, he probably doesn't have many guys around him, so he he won't have that good of a game. Let's just... I mean, you can't hide under a bunch of blankets and hope the problem goes away. You have to actively do something. I don't know what's worse. Gannon just sitting on his hands, not having a damn clue? Or Sirianni and Jalen Hurts, a combination of that offense, refusing to go with something they know would work because it moves away from your identity. That's how Brady, that's how Belichick and the two of them used to just undress teams in the playoffs. And unfortunately for us, we got to see our football team and the coaching staff get undressed by Tom Brady. Completely ran through that way. And we knew it. I talked about it last week with Matt and Evan. It was a key that I brought up all week, whatever platform you can find me, writing about it here, talking about it on TV, wherever. Sure, the obvious key, everybody was on that, was, well, the Eagles have to run, the Eagles have to run. And they didn't run enough. But it wasn't just throw the football, it was throw it deep. Dallas Goddard's empty stat sheet, Devontae Smith absent stat sheet until the fourth quarter. That stuff can't happen. It can't go down that way. And it was something we thought the Eagles offense was able to learn from. They didn't. They clearly didn't. And you can look at lack of talent, the talent gap. You can look at all of that. But the bottom line is this team was not ready for prime time. From a player standpoint to coaching standpoint, veterans to rookies, this team was not ready for prime time. They did not answer the bell. They were buying into all this underdog stuff like it was just going to happen like in 2017. It didn't just happen in 2017. A lot of things worked their favor and their way. Some of it, if not all of it, or close to it, was their own doing. Can't you show up? You can't. You have to make adjustments. You have to coach. You have to go out there and do stuff. G. Cobb, then the Philly Voice panel, then some final thoughts on the season. G. Cobb is with us, Fox 29, gcobb.com. You can see him. You can hear him everywhere. And not many know the league in and out like Gary, especially looking at the positives and negatives that were from the season. G, let me just start first and foremost with Sunday's game and looking back kind of at that game. What does that do? Like the way in which they lost, the fact in which they lost so bad to the Bucs, how does that put a spin either positive, maybe you can salvage something on the season, or does this tarnish a little bit of what they did coming into the playoffs? Uh, without the doubt, you know, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. You know, a lot of the fans, uh, which is, you know, who they play for, um, can't feel good about the fact that, you know, you want to be competitive. Now, you you don't mind getting beat. I mean, because you got a young team, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going to beat the Bucks, especially the Bucks got healthier and, and, and they went in and they played the way they're capable. But you would like to see a competitive game. You know, I felt bad for uh, Troy Aikman. You know, I, I know when I see him, I'm going to say, hey, man, you know, hey, you got to fill in two hours. We, we, we got a <laughs> blowout. So you guys got, you know, so they have to talk about stuff they don't want to talk about, you know, whatever. 
just finding things to talk about because the game is basically over. I know they didn't enjoy that. In fact, at a little place in there, it seemed like he says he would have rather been at the yep. um, the Cowboy game, you know, because you know that no, that was a that was a very good game. The, the um, Cowboys and the 49ers. But the thing is, the Eagles. I just didn't think they adjusted. You know, uh, the um, the Bucks made some adjustments for them, and they didn't adjust. Because, like Troy was saying during the game, they could have thrown out routes all day mm -hmm. long because the Bucks' corners were playing off of them, but they were taking away, you know, those option runs by blitzing them. They were sending three guys over there, and you know, they they kind of ran them out of that. But uh, offensively, they were out of it, and then defensively, you know, Tom is going to dink and dunk you. You know, you got to go up and take some of that away. So you could get some hits on him. Now they were able to get to him, you know, once they had that injury. But they still they weren't able to force any turnovers, and it just it just didn't feel good. I mean, you look up at thirty-one nothing going into the, the fourth quarter. Mm. Some people just went ahead, probably left the game, you know. So <laughs> you feel bad about that because they worked so hard. But you know, uh, they made progress this year. That's what you got to look at yeah. uh, with Jalen. I don't think, you know, you can guarantee how much of a, uh, you know, they're going to give Jalen that job. You know, I, I couldn't guarantee that. Uh, I think he made improvement this year. He did make improvement. You know, he's a better quarterback now. But is he a franchise quarterback that's going to take you to the dance and help you win the dance? You know, yep. I think somebody be, had to be, you know, dishonest to say we're sure of that. But the kid does work hard. You like that. I think next year he probably is going to have, still have the job because there's no marquee guys in the draft. And so I don't see them getting so sold on somebody in the draft that they say, look, we're going to give up these picks for this person. We're going to we're going to uh, really do everything around this person. None of these guys have been graded that high. Now, sometimes guys get on a roll, but that's going to be the Eagles' call. I, I could see that they're, they're probably going to draft some defensive linemen, yep. maybe get a marquee linebacker uh, that has got the speed and athleticism, you know, that you need now uh, if you're going to be a linebacker. You can, if you can't run, I don't care how many tackles you make, you can't run in the NFL. <laughs> you're not, you, they're going to go after you in the passing game. So they could use a an elite linebacker that's really got the speed to run with the uh the with receivers really. That's what you got to be able to do now. So it, it really they've got some tough decisions to make. But I, I don't I don't see the marquee quarterback. It's, they're not there. Now if the marquee quarterback was there coming out in this draft, they probably would go after them. Because you think on the strength of yesterday's game alone, like maybe they were thinking, hey, we like this kid, we like this kid, but if there were a marquee player out there, they would go based off of what we saw on Sunday? Yeah, like let's say um, let, let's say they really, you know, they were sold on the kid at Alabama and he was coming out this year. Yeah. You know, they probably would say, because I know the way that uh, Jeffrey Lurie feels about quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. If you got up, come oh, yeah. on. You look at the, the games yesterday, you know, um, clearly, come on, you got Mahomes. If you know you got a Mahomes, are you not going to say, look, hey, we love you, kid. <laughs> but, but this <laughs> bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Even he has to understand that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you had, a, a you know, an elite guy like that right there. So I don't see that guy. Uh, we'll, we'll probably know if they feel like that guy is going to be in this draft, but I haven't heard anything. They do not rate these guys as high. Mm -hmm. So I think that Jalen is going to be the quarterback next year. And if he can use, continues to improve, you know, it could be his job. But I don't think he's – you can't say he's nailed it down yesterday after that performance. I, right. I, you know, I, I see people that, that – look. I mean, I love the kid. He's a good kid. You know, uh, he's got all of the, um, you know, the, the qualities that you want to see in a leader and all that. But you got to have that arm. You got to have that accuracy. 
You got to have a feel for the game. So, hey, guy comes open, you're moving. You know, the way Mahomes is able to ad lib, hey, he's going to find it. If that guy's, there's a guy out there open, some gun's going to find him. I don't know if Jalen's going to find him. You see where the throw to Devontae Smith, first of all, they go to hold that, that you know, he, he should have been, you figure, if he's got a good feel for things, he's going to be telling the coach, look, I got to get the ball to Devontae. Yeah. You know, and and um, and um Sirianni, come on, dude. He was like, you're not getting the ball to the kid. They got the corners playing 10 yards off. They could go ahead and take eight yards, hits. Take it. Brady would have taken it all day long. You know, and so getting a feel for the game. Now, that's the kind of thing where I, I blame the coach more than the quarterback. Yep. But, um, but I do like the prog – I see progress that Jalen has made. We didn't see a lot of it yesterday. But clearly in the games, he's become better as a pocket quarterback. Uh, they threw a lot of exotic stuff at him yesterday. You know, they had guys standing up. They had big uh, <laughs> Vita Vea uh, dropping yeah. out of there, 370-pound dude. You know, they, they were showing him different looks. They did that on purpose. Come on, because they, they know that uh, they, they wouldn't be doing that. But but they wanted to give him good looks to get him, you know, where he get him thinking and panicking. You got to be cool and calm in that situation. Take what they give you. If you're getting the ball out of your hands and you start out, then eventually things are going to come to you. But um, that that was that was not a that, that didn't look good. I mean, I, it was hard, it was hard to look at that game. Oh, it's really tough. You mentioned feel for the game. I, I want to get your thoughts on the side of the ball that you played because I look at all of the things you laid out with offense. I agree. I think Sirianni and more importantly, Jar Jalen Hurts have earned the benefit of the doubt this year with what they've done to come back and see yep. how they bounce back. I tell you, G, my biggest concern, and this is more emphasis on Howie Roseman in the front office to get these guys you mentioned on defense right in the draft. My biggest concern is that the defensive coordinator has no feel for the game and has been bailed out a lot against bad teams because he has some football players out there. He's got a ball hawk in Darius Slay. He's got yeah. a guy in Fletcher Cox and Hargraves who can lead that front. Like yesterday against the, the Bucks, they yeah. started to get penetration with a four-man front. And to your point about moving they around with Tampa like Bowles was doing, Gannon wasn't stunting. Gannon wasn't moving. Gannon got, there was no exotic blitzing or any even movement on the front four. It was just, hey, hey, Fletch, man, can you help me out and just yeah. get to the quarterback here or there? That's my biggest concern over this past year is he looked really good against bad teams. They look terrible against good teams on defense, and it's not the players so much as it's the coaches. Yeah, and, you know, even more specifically, he looked very good against bad quarterbacks. A good quarterback yeah. pick, picked him apart. And and you just see he's not aggressive at all. You know, you you can't go in – um, you can't go into those games scared, man. You just – you know, you don't have too much respect for the opponent. You know, Tom Brady makes mistakes too. So you want to show him different looks? You know, why wouldn't you? You want to show him different looks? You want to, uh, you know, I would throw some zone blitzes where yeah, it's unorthodox, you. where thank you're you. blitzing a corner, but you're playing zone behind it. So you don't give up the big play, but maybe you you catch uh, uh, Brady in the ear or something, you know, where you, right. you kind of shake him up some. You can't have too much respect for people. You know, that's not the way you play the game. And I think with the, um, Jonathan Gannon, he definitely he plays a safe game. And in fact, um, I think it was uh, they asked um, the uh, the tight end. Um, was it Goddard or Gronk? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Tampa's tight end. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gronk or Brake? Gronk, Gronk. They asked okay. Gronk. And Gronk said, what about the Eagles? How do they play? He said, they're safe. They're, they believe in being safe. <laughs> yeah. So, you know they know, because you can look at the tape and see everybody's backing off of everybody. Come on, man. You know, these guys are good, but you can't go in worshiping the other team. You got to be willing to, you know, they make mistakes. As great as uh, Tampa Bay, you know, come on. They're, they're a good team, but they make mistakes. And you believe the team that plays them next week is going to go after them. They're not mm -hmm. sitting there going, oh, man, we're playing the Bucks. Forget that. 
go after them because that's the way you get their respect. They can't really have a lot of respect for them. And Jonathan Gannon, you know, they got to have a talk with them. And they really, to go in that game and play it like that, because Tampa was not really flowing offensively either. Nope. But yeah, they were able to go down and score because the Eagles were playing so, um, you know, there's no other word. I mean, you know, they were scared, passive, whatever, however you want to say. Wasn't an aggressive It's not game a good plan. one. And then scared, you look on safe. the other hand, you see it, Todd Bowles, he was throwing mm. everything in the kitchen yep. sink at the Eagles. Come on. Why, why are you not going to show, you know, and that's why I say, like, you could throw a zone blitz. Because you can run a zone blitz, and the only thing you're leaving open is the flat, the short flat. But you still got the guys deep. But you get a chance. You you know you you go in there, and it's it's un, he, he doesn't expect it. And all of a sudden, you're hitting him in his ribs. Now that shakes him up. And you know I've seen Tom get shook up when he gets hit. You know he's human. <laughs> so they didn't do any of that. And you know nope. that that's nope. not the way you want to go out. You don't want to go out without a fight. They didn't even put right. up a fight, man. That's the thing. And that's Michael uh, Spinks Jonathan put up more of a fight, the, G. He, he's part of the reason for that. Yeah. No, I, I look, I appreciate the insight, especially after a, a long, strange season, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. And to end that way, we needed your insight as far as how to take anything and everything into account. Fox 29, where you could see him, G. Kyle. That's right. But I, I tell you, they course. got some big decisions to make. I tell you that. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Defense, quarterback, maybe like there's a lot of different things. And they also need it's not just personnel. It's how to use that personnel. That's, That's what I'm true. gathering from you as well. Right. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to tell coaches goodbye. You know, like uh, <laughs> Nick might have to go in and say, hey, man, I love you and everything. But we right. got to move on. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Chief, thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Have a great week. All right. You too. All right, we've assembled the crew here. Jimmy Kemsky, Matt Mullen, Evan Macy. We have a lot to look at from a season that started off questionable to looking like it could end on a positive note. And then we went right back to where we began here, watching a team that just crumbled in the postseason. So let's look at the game itself. But I, I kind of just want to look at the game itself and the backdrop, really, of the season. So, Jimmy, you're down in Tampa covering this team all season. We should start with you just being as close as you are to this team, the players and the team and the chemical makeup from the front office down to those guys. Do you think, and if so, how much does this final game against Brady and that Bucks team either tarnish the season or maybe add some context to a good season? Yeah, I think the way that you put that is, is good and that it adds context to the season. Um, I don't know if it tarnishes it because they certainly overachieved. Personally, I had them before training camp at, as like a six win team after training camp. I bumped it up to seven. They wind up winning nine. They go to the playoffs, which I don't think many people expected. Uh, they played a lot of bad teams and a lot of bad quarterbacks along the way to get there. Early in the season, they played a lot of really good quarterbacks and those really good quarterbacks shredded them. You had five quarterbacks, of course, that, you know, through for 80% completion percentage or higher against them early in the season, which is crazy. Like that kind of efficiency is just, just nuts, you know, from Tom Brady to Patrick Mahomes to Dak Prescott to Derek Carr to uh, 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 Justin uh, Herbert. Uh, they all, you know, went up and down the field on the Eagles. And that's what we saw, of course, in this wild card game with, with Tom Brady once again. So we saw those issues crop back up. I think we saw a lot of the same issues crop back up with Jalen Hurts and his inaccuracy, his inability to often see, you know, open receivers down the field. I think he got better in both of those areas as the season progressed, but they came back big time uh, in this playoff game. So it, what, the way that you phrase that, where like it, this last game provided context, it was a reminder that, yeah, they made the playoffs and they beat some bad teams along the way, but they have a long way to go before they can compete with the big boys. That makes, Ab yeah, yeah man. absolutely. I mean, it's, it was, kind of like a lot of those things, like Jimmy said, that were problems earlier in the season that we thought had been either fixed or improved upon. You know, we were, like Jimmy said, we were kind of reminded that, you know, maybe it did have more to do with the schedule. So I think that's going to be really the hard part now is trying to parse what was kind of fool's gold down the stretch and what was real. Um, because 
yesterday it looked like none of it was real and i assume that's not the case you know there were improvements made things were done better but now the job of the coaching staff in front office is kind of going to be to look around and figure out what they can bank on moving forward and what is going to be only able to get done against you know sub 500 teams you know there's a lot of fun things about doing this job in this particular city but to me, never ceases to amaze me that a team that wasn't expected to win more than seven games make playoffs, and then everybody who's a fan of the team or covering the team is completely exacerbated that they didn't win a playoff <laughs> against the two seed on the road with a rookie head coach. I just I can't believe that I can believe it because it always happens. But it's just absurd that the tone in the city is just like doom and gloom because this team that was supposed to do nothing did something and then didn't do more. And so everybody's pissed. It's, I don't know. It's funny and it's expected. Let me throw it back at you and then get Matt and and Jimmy, your opinion on this as well, because you raise a very interesting point that's happening that we're living and breathing right now, of course, in this city, which is the reaction to what happened on Sunday with the bucks. I think for me personally, what upsets me the most is not the final score, but them reverting back. And look, maybe that's who they are. Maybe maybe I need to come to grips with they are just a team that can't beat good teams, they can't beat playoff teams. But it looked like that stretch. Matt said fool's gold. You still have to go out and beat these bad teams. I get that. But it looked like they didn't either learn anything from it or take anything away from it, or they just immediately reverted back to that failure of a football team that we saw at two and five. That That's what I think gets me so frustrated, Evan, if that makes sense, more so than just, oh, they didn't beat the Bucs. Like, yeah, they didn't beat the Bucs. And I'm a little disappointed they didn't cover that line, but more so a matter of just going out and reverting back to what they were. Yeah, we gave predictions last week before the Bucks game, and I, I know I said that I thought that they would look like a real football team, and they, they kind of didn't. So that that is disappointing. But I don't know. Rookie head coach. Uh, you got a quarterback who's never played in the NFL playoffs before, who's 24 years old, Tom Brady, a team that's like just really good. It's Temple going up against Duke in the first round and losing by 30 in the NCAA tournament. And everybody can't believe, oh, Temple dominated the A-10. Why didn't they like stay close with Duke? It's it's two different caliber. I mean, this this seven team playoff field is so stupid. I don't know. I I, I the Steelers <laughs> and the Eagles game really just show that like they're just two completely different gear in the NFL, and the Eagles aren't in this gear. I, I mean, that's my takeaway. I'm really not putting the minutia of like the things they didn't do well. They just were overmatched. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I like I, your point on the uh, on the on the playoff teams. The Eagles got smoked. The Steelers got smoked last year. The Bears got smoked. I don't remember who the seventh seed in the AFC left, was last year, but they were a quick exit too. But uh, the point that you make, uh, Evan, is is dead on. It's just it's it's a disparity in, in talent between a team like the Eagles and a team like the Buccaneers. I mean, you, you look forward to the Eagles off season, and uh, they have needs across the board. Uh, pretty much, you know, any position you can name it. The quarterback, you know, discussion aside on whether they're going to trade for a vet, they're going to roll with Jalen Hurts going forward, draft a quarterback. You know, that that discussion aside, I mean, they have needs everywhere from edge rusher to linebacker to cornerback to safety, uh, you know, running back you can throw in there, certainly wide receiver. Uh, we, you know, we learned all season that Jalen Rager can't play. Yep. Uh, the, only, the only position I think they're really strong at is the offensive line, and that's kind of been the case for a really long time with this team. But what we saw yesterday was just – the Bucks have this kind of talent, and the Eagles have this kind of talent, and they're not on the same level. And you know, the Eagles can get better this offseason. They have three first round picks, they have ten picks overall. They're not in cap hell anymore. They're not, in, you know, really, they're not really super cap healthy. But if there's a player that they really like in free agency, they can go out and get him uh, this offseason, where they were, you know at a major disadvantage of being able to do that a season ago. So I think it's a good starting point this season. I think this season just kind of serves as, you know, starting to trend upward, whereas we are seeing more of a decline from year to year from the Super Bowl year in 2017, got worse in 2018, got worse in 2019, got way worse in 2020. And now you think you're start, you're starting to see them come back up now. Yeah. And I would agree that on the whole, I mean, you can't argue that they're in a better position now than they were a year ago. Yeah. Um, I do worry, you know, again, we go back to, you know, 
the expectations on the season coming into the season. I was kind of like you, Jimmy, six, seven wins. Yeah. Um, but I, I had written, I, I thought it was more important that they were better at the end of the season than they were at the beginning of the season, that they looked better, that Sirianni knew, looked like he knew what he was doing, that Hurts looked like. And I thought for most of the season, it was trending that way. You know, they were getting better. And then yesterday was kind of a big, you know, letdown and go in the opposite direction. But I think overall, you know, Evan was talking earlier about the fan base being disappointed and stuff like that. I really don't think they there's anything they should be disappointed about if you step back and look at it as a whole because of what Jimmy just said. They're in a better position now than they were a year ago after a couple years of sliding in the wrong direction. Um, so, you know, yesterday might have been tough. It was made better by getting to watch the Cowboys loss after it. But it <laughs> yeah. was um, it was still a tough day. But I think, you know, you kind of have to separate that from the rest of the season and look at the big picture because if you just focus on yesterday's game, obviously you're going to be left feeling sour about the season. So let's look at this, Matt. I'll, we'll start with you here and we go with Jimmy and Evan as, as well. Who, in your opinion, and you can balance this with your opinion combined with what you think the organization will do. Who do you think stands out the most? And you have the benefit of going first here, so you may take an obvious one off the board. But who lost their job after Sunday? You know, at halftime or like a little before halftime, I would probably would have said Jonathan Gannon. Um, but I thought he did some decent stuff um, adjusting, playing, you know, the the guys a little bit tighter. Um, and they, they had done a good job getting stops uh, for a couple drives in a row before that the, the muffed punt there by Rieger. Um, and, you know, that kind of turned everything back the other way and gave the Bucks all the momentum back after the Eagles looked like they were building a little bit. So I probably... Um, I would have said him, but I mean, the obvious answer is Jalen Rager. Your your finger was so close to that Gannon button, though. <laughs> I know. I know it was, but, you know, I, I come on. Yeah, how can you watch that game and not say he was the, the number one um, villain, so to speak, yesterday? Well, Jimmy's going to have to look a little deeper since he took <laughs> the obvious one off the board here. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, so the guy that I thought, you know, really had to have a big game, and he actually, like, did a few nice things was Fletcher Cox, because I think when you look at um, Tom Brady and what he's able to do moving around in the pocket, he's not a threat to run, obviously, and he's going to be in the pocket, but he moves around well enough and he gets the ball quickly. Guy like him, you got to get pressure on his face like that, or you know, he's going to shred you. And do you actually, the, actually, the Eagles did get to the did get to him three or four times, and Brian Kerrigan showed up out of nowhere. <laughs> she had a decent game, which was kind of weird. Uh, but Fletcher <laughs> Cox, you know, I think the Eagles should have, moved on from him, like traded him before his value went down uh, during the 2021 offseason. Uh, they tried to move him, or they were certainly willing to move him at the trade deadline uh, this season. I think this offseason, he's a guy that you know they'll, they'll look to move on from because he's got a big cap number, and uh, he's clearly on the downside of his career. And this was a game where he had to be stellar for them to, you know, I mean, him being like, Vintage Fletcher Cox uh, in this game would have, you know, gone a long way toward, toward, you know, upsetting this Buccaneers team. And we just haven't seen any anything close to his the old version of him in, in quite a while. So I think he's a guy that this offseason they're going to look to try to trade maybe to, a uh, you know, a, a team that's a little bit closer to maybe winning a Super Bowl and uh, move on from his pay and hopefully get from their perspective, hopefully get, you know, something decent in return in terms of draft draft pick compensation. Well, I'm going last, and you took two good ones from me. Um, I don't necessarily think there's going to be a huge shakeup. I'm not following unemployed coaches on LinkedIn, so I don't really have a good <laughs> finger on the pulse there. As far as uh, some some replacement can be made, I think the coaching staff probably deserves to to run it back with a better roster next year. And uh, I I'm not a salary cap expert. I know Jimmy's the closest that we have in the room right now. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't appear like there's a ton of guys who A, are important and are going to be free agents, and B, who are really tradable or appeal to trade. I guess I'll say Derek Barnett because it's always him and he's a free agent. Um, so I'll, I'll go with that one. <laughs> Fair enough. Look, <laughs> it, it, we saw early on, right, a costly penalty that uh, it definitely extended and, and led to some points. So it makes sense that that's not necessarily a, a deeper one. I think a lot of people would agree with that. If, if, especially if it makes sense, as you mentioned from a salary standpoint, all right, let's wind down on this. I think the expectation at the very least, right. And 
correct me if I'm wrong. Any of you, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I think the general acceptance is unless they find some sort of trade for Russell Wilson, that Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni are going to be back as a tandem. If that's true, they do have a bunch of picks. This wouldn't be the first time. And I don't know if it's going to be 15th overall in the first round, but is there any concern or maybe belief? Jimmy, let's start with you here to wind down on this thing. Is there any concern slash belief that they may in the first three rounds draft a quarterback? (laughs) Yeah, so when I look at the quarterback position, I don't think there's – I mean, if they can certainly upgrade on Jalen Hurts, whether that's trading for a Russell Wilson. They they obviously tried to – they obviously had interest in Deshaun Watson. Mm-hmm. There are reports lately that uh, with M- the Miami Dolphins uh, firing Brian Flores that they are probably out on Deshaun Watson. That's a name that's, that, that's, a name that's just kind of still <laughs> sitting there and lingering, and I know that a lot of people don't want to bring him to Philly because of his off-the-field stuff, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but he's still out there. Russell Wilson is still out there, likely to change teams, you know, one way or the other this offseason. And then, you know, all it takes is beauty in, is, is sort of in the eye of the beholder in terms of, uh, you know, drafting a quarterback. I know it's been sort of said that this isn't a strong quarterback class in this draft. I'll sort of disagree. It's not as good as the one the year before. I think it's an OK quarterback class. So if you really like a guy like Kenny Pickett, um, you know, certainly teams are going to be interested in him. There's um, uh, Matt Corral out of Ole Miss. Teams are certainly going to like him. Malik Willis um, out of Liberty. Go on down the list. And maybe the Eagles fall in love with one of these guys, and they think that he can be a significant upgrade uh, over Jalen Hurts. I don't know. I mean, certainly you got to feed the quarterback factory, as uh, as Howie Roseman uh, has, has, you know, done pretty, uh, you know, uh, consistently yep. uh, throughout his general manager career. So I don't think it's a, it's a slam dunk that, that Jalen Hurts will, will be, I think it's likely that he'll be the quarterback in 2022. Uh, but I certainly don't think it's uh it's set in stone that, that he will be the guy next off season. If the Eagles can, you know, find the right deal to upgrade at that position, but he did show enough in my opinion, during the 2021 season that if the right deal doesn't come along, then, you know, they can give him another year to sort of, again, show what he can do. Yeah, the um, the simple and most logical answer is probably that Hertz is going to be the guy and he's cheap and he's still on his rookie deal and he did enough. But the one thing I can say for certain is that Howie Roseman just takes swings at quarterback. I yes. mean, who would have thought he would have made those two trades to get Wentz at this point before the 2016 draft? Uh, the fact that he was able to get a first pick for for Sam Bradford is an mm-hmm. absurd notion. And then picking Jalen Hurts in the second round right after you pay Carson Wentz a monster contract to be your franchise quarterback also kind of makes no sense. So I guess it probably should be expected that something ridiculous happens at quarterback just based on Howie Roseman's track record. And that's probably the best take I can give on it. Awesome. Appreciate you guys hanging with me and, and being a part of post-flight all season. Uh, I know we've tracked Jimmy down at odd hours on the road. So (laughs) thank you for that. And and we've taken you away, Evan, from quality father time. So thank (laughs) you both. And and Matt Mullen as well, who just didn't want to answer. Apparently he's like, I've had it with this show. (laughs) It's over. It's our final one. Appreciate you guys. Thanks again. Yeah, guys. Take take care. care. Everybody wants to talk about the quarterback. They're going to use one game as some sort of statement on whether or not Jalen Hurts should be back. Jalen Hurts deserves the benefit of the doubt to see what happens next year. You're not losing on any opportunity to solidify a franchise quarterback moving forward, even if you're looking at trading for Deshaun Watson, which I don't see happening. Rumors, reports about Watson, Flores landing there, that tandem, already it's out here. So forget that. Not that I even want him at this point. Aaron Rodgers is a pipe dream. Russell Wilson is probably a crapshoot, especially because this team isn't that appealing. Coaching staff isn't that appealing. The team around the quarterback isn't really that appealing. And if you're Russell Wilson, you don't really want to have to do the work that Jalen. There's a lot of work that Jalen Hurts did this year, carrying the football, carrying the offense, doing a lot on the ground and in the air, taking hits and everything. A lot of work. You're Russell Wilson. You want protection. You want to be able to get the football out. You want to win some football games. So put that in the back burner here. 
The only way the Philadelphia Eagles address the quarterback spot is if they get trigger happy like we've seen this front office do in the past. You heard Jimmy talk about that on the panel where there's a possibility. They may look at the draft, second, third round. There's a possibility. They may look and say, well, free agents. There's a possibility. They may trade. There is a possibility, a very strong possibility, that the team will use Sunday's game against the Bucs as the end-all, be-all. The arm strength, the questions about that with Jalen Hurts, the decision-making to throw the football, the neglecting of a guy like Devontae Smith, all of that could factor in very easily to a decision to at least try to move on from Hertz. I think it's a mistake. I think if you try to build something with stability, you need a year, two years, see what you have. Nobody's asking this team to lock in for the next five years, Jalen Hurts, but based off of the contract situation, draft picks that you can to especially address the defense, and we want this team to address the defense in the first round because the higher you draft a kid, ideally, the less he's going to need coaching and all these other things that could be screwed up by Jonathan Gannon and that crew. But we want this team to address issues outside of the quarterback spot. First and foremost, I think you just exhale and say, Jalen Hurts is back next year. Let's build this team around it, around the quarterback spot and around it being the idea of Jalen Hurts back. You know what you have in Hurts. You know what you can do with Hurts. Wide receiver position needs a massive overhaul, massive. The reality is, is that the only two people that should be back, Devontae Smith in a number one spot and Quez Watkins in a 3-4 spot. Depending on how deep you can get, use Watkins' size and speed as an off receiver, not as somebody that you're relying on a ton. Put him in a Jalen Rager situation and see if Watkins can carry the football as well as he can get downfield. Jalen Rager's out. He's got to go. He, he cannot continue to hurt this football team. Cannot. I don't know what happens with the center spot. I don't know what happens with Fletcher Cox on the D. You heard Kemsky say that there's a chance, pretty good chance, that the Eagles will look to trade him too. But you better do two things immediately if you're the Philadelphia Eagles. One, address the defense. Two, royally address the wide receiver, aggressively address the wide receiver position. You have a luxury here in Dallas Goddard, and that should help you in building the wide receiver position. And then you need to work with Jalen Hurts. Get him to sit down with Josh Allen or somebody that just improved drastically over a year and see what you have. There's a lot to be excited about this Eagles team when you look at them beating on bad teams. There's a lot to be concerned about this Eagles team because there's a noticeable gap between Philadelphia and playoff teams. Playoff teams that are moving on and doing things. And the Eagles aren't there yet. It's a long offseason, but we're going to be here. We'll have the draft and a bunch of other off-season moves covered. We appreciate you hanging with us all season. Feel free to go back, check any games you missed. Hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribed. At Shander Show for me. Thanks to Philly Voice for allowing this. Have a great weekend. Have a great week, off-season and all. And remember, try and stay sane out there, Birds fans.